I'm going to be cussing the entire time. <laughs> All right, we're recording. That's how this gets started. We're, we okay, started. so we're currently live, so we're going to count down. Three, two, one, and we are live. So we are live, and uh, we just got back from uh, got back from eating dinner. From Most the basic, if you guys have heard of side basic, we all just got back from that. Had a little side basic pow wow. Yeah. What would you guys think of that dinner? It was great, man. It's always cool to hang out with other people who are trying to develop themselves, you know? Yeah. I mean, for me, it was great because I literally <laughs> got my food and had to leave and go show a house. So that was cool. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you should have had Jonathan go. Like, he's your <laughs> assistant. <laughs> We have a whole conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I literally was like, man, I bet I could have John show this if I really want to be a dick and not act as a leader. But I was like, you know what? Like, I'm just going to take the L because it's my business at the end of the day. <laughs> and I'd rather him enjoy his time. That's take, awesome. take, you said take the O? The L. The L. Yeah, that's what I wondered. It's not really an L if I get a question <laughs> out of it, though. just sitting here <laughs> eating while we're, so. like, trying to be like, <laughs> <laughs> like, you guys might not be able to hear it as well, but, like, literally all I hear is, like, the, <laughs> <laughs> no way, are you serious? Yeah, I was going to mention that when we first came on. I was just like, yeah, Jordan's still eating. <laughs> this is episode a, one. a bad idea. This is episode one. Yeah, this is going to be all right. So, this is going to uh, be highly edited. Yeah, so we actually didn't really come up with a plan on what we were going to say or talk about. So, uh, I figured what we start off with is just talking about the side basic, if you guys are cool with that. Yeah, and uh, one thing that you guys got from the side basic and why everybody should go to it, and they should have went to it when we brought it to Fort Wayne. But uh, now it's going to be a little bit more difficult, but you should still go. Uh, so whoever wants to start. Well, the side basic is a course. It's a three-day course. It's about self-discovery. It's about overcoming your limiting beliefs. And the coolest thing about the entire program is that you don't have some guru shouting at you. It's not a counselor talking to you. You do things and experience things by yourself and with groups of people, and then you basically get to learn from the results. So it's a way of learning from yourself, looking at yourself, and doing self-reflection without anybody's input except for yourself. You just have to live with the results, which is, for me, was the most powerful part of it because I have a really hard time with like accepting criticism and that sort of thing. But when I'm the one that did it and then I have to live with it, it was the best thing that I've ever done in my life. I'm glad mm. that I went. Yeah, I mean, it just just the value that it provides. I mean, it just, uh, like my, my analogy was, um, I mean, they actually reference it quite a lot. If you think of an iceberg, um, the 10% above the water is, is, is what people see. It's what we even see about ourselves, but it's really the 90% under the ocean that's running the fucking machine. And, and really, the basic event just teaches you awareness of what that is. Like I, I, At least that's my perception of it. And just being able to even see it allows you to start asking questions and like, like, okay, hold on, wait, what am I doing? And why did I do this? It was because of this that happened to me when I was a kid. You know, like, it, you can really, like, trace back, like, the problems of your childhood or, like, the things that have happened in your life that caused you to be the way that you are. It's just, it's super empowering. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. So, uh, Jordan and I are fresh off of size seven. So Whoa. I'm trying to remember the basic, which is, <laughs> which is the, which is the advanced version of the basic. The life success so, course, yeah. yeah. So, um, it was, I'm, I'm trying to really go back to the basic and remember what those feelings were. I can tell you the advanced program brought a whole lot of shit to me for sure. Um, but the, uh, the basic was really cool in that it was a lot of about, um, getting your mind around the fact that like you have programming inside you, it's undeniable. Everybody else does too. And just really making you aware that like, Hey, the things that you do were like, like in my case, I'm like, yeah, I'm just kind of an asshole. Uh, that is a program that I've chose to run for a long time. Now, that program still runs. I don't mean to say, oh, it's all gone or anything like that. But everything about you, you've decided at one point, whether it's I'm unorganized or, you know, I, I don't connect well with other people or everybody else in the world is a jerk. That's a program that you chose to run. So the basic was really cool in pointing that out in like ways that you just can't refute. Yeah, and then I was going to say, the funny thing is, like, all those programs that you pointed out are programs that when you could see in, like, a negative light, but there's also programs that you tell yourself from, like, when you were a kid that could be positive, that you told yourself you're positive, but still has some negative 
like, you know, connotations in other aspects of your life. So one thing that I got from the basic, I'm sure I shared it with you guys whenever I was telling everybody to go and like what I got from it. But uh, it was a time when I was in front of all the people and Cortland was like, all right, so uh, think back to your earliest memory. I was like, okay, cool. I was like, you know, six years old or whatever. And then he was like, Okay, and, uh, you know, tell me about it. And so basically I told him about it. You know, my parents, uh, I got off the bus. My parents are not there at the house. And, um, yeah, basically they was gone. And I was like, all right. Um, I just felt like, you know, basically he asked me, he's like, how would you feel in that moment? And I never thought about how I felt in that moment until he actually, like, asked me, how would you feel in that moment? And it's funny because at, like, you know, five or six years old, however old I was, I was just like, I felt like I was like, all right, I got to be the man. I got to step up. Like, I got to be that person from here on out. And uh, basically, um, that has, like, changed my entire life to where I've lived my life from that. So I took, you know, a negative event and I made something positive out of it. But then sometimes that that still kind of, like, has a negative connotation from, you know, just that event or from that feeling of stepping up. Because now I feel like... You know, a lot of times like, man, nobody else can do what I do because I got I got to take control of this situation. I got to do it. So, um, yeah, it's interesting how your programs can sometimes be negative and or positive. But well, and you're talking about negative and positive too. like you can repurpose things that happened to you in your past that you believe were <laughs> terrible. Um, and there's not very many mechanisms or like programs or anything that can help you do that. I think size one of the best ones. So. You know, if you, uh, that happened to you and you felt like it was bad, you might have the ability to repurpose that into something that's actually valuable for you in the future. And I think a lot of times you always, Dakota, you always talked about like self image and your mindset and that sort of thing. And I used to think it was silly. And now like I've come to like believe that it's the most important thing because Mm. I discovered that in order to believe that something great and amazing and abundant and uh like if something in the future is that much more possible you have to be able to believe that there are there's something different in your past that's holding you back like in order to get to the place you want to get in the future or believe that something is possible you have to change how you look at your past so i think that like being able to repurpose those things is what yeah i mean i really love like how they talk about like the content of your life and then the context is like the bowl the bowl the content of your life is like the fruit all the things that are in the bowl uh but really like the content's always changing everything in your life's always changing it's it's how big of a bowl that you have that you can deal with the shit in your life or or the the opportunities or your vision like you really like in order to have more content in your life you have to have a bigger context you have to have a bigger bowl um, and, and I think that's that's one of the great things that Sai is it, it teaches you awareness about that. And I mean, I think all of us in this room, like we're all super focused on like self improvement, motivation. We follow the, all these guys like Ed Milet, Andy Frisella, you know, all all these big players. And like, I think I've got no more value out of Sai Seven than I've ever gotten out of just listening to people on YouTube. Like, because you actually feel it, and it's it's so directly correlated to you. Like, it's all about you. That's it. Like, and, 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 like, I love how they talk about, like, you are the source of everything. It's how you, like, you could piss me off, but it's not you pissing me off. It's, it's, it's me being perceived as pissed off. I'm allowing myself to be pissed off. Uh, like, I love Dakota says, fear is an emotion. Courage is a choice. Like, that's a great quote that he pulled from somewhere. And it's true. Like, fear can be used as a strength. It doesn't have to just be you know, something that holds you back. And, and, and that's that's something that uh, Sai taught me, which is uh, super powerful, like to start using those emotions for how you want them to be used instead of them using you. Yeah. What was your uh, what was your biggest takeaway from Sai 7 without giving anything away? Oh, man, I can't say my biggest takeaway without giving anything away. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> what was her name again? <laughs> uh, uh, no, so... <laughs> My biggest takeaway was an STI. <laughs> oh my god! Wow. Hey, thirty day commitment. Yeah, they make you do that. They do, they do make you do that. Um, I didn't need to use mine, but they made they make you do that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I think my biggest takeaway was probably 
Um, on, just the tools that they teach you there. And mm. I'm not sure if I share it, if that would take away from people, because I don't want somebody to listen to it and be like, oh, fuck, I can use that tool, and then just not, not do the experience. Well, well tell, so, us about, tell us about the tools that you got, not the thing that actually got you to get there. Tell us about what you got from Right, but I, okay, fair enough. My fear is about them having the tool, and then, because I can see myself being like, oh, I have the tool, I don't well, fucking need to go. But there's so many there's things. There's so much yeah. more, and you and I know that, but I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean generally, like, when there. you spend seven days completely off the grid with 50 plus other people that are hyper focused on the exact same goal of self development growth and becoming the best version of themselves i mean that human energy is powerful like sure. let alone unplugging like sure. i mean so i mean i think you're fine to share oh, fair enough so i think my biggest <clears throat> takeaway was um so when i went there i was like really committed to feeling my emotions again on a full spectrum was like my big commitment. Um, and one of the tools that helped me to do that was uh, being able to feel those feelings and before I like shove them down, because you always feel the feelings, but you can choose to shove them down. And the more you do it, the quicker you get at it too, to where you, mm -hmm. I perceived myself as not having those feelings anymore. Um, so the biggest thing for me was uh, getting the tools to be able to accept that those feelings are there, that I genuinely deserve to have those feelings. Like I'm allowed to feel happy, sad, jealous, emotional, whatever the case may be. I'm allowed to feel that. And then uh, having the tools to be like, OK, so why do I feel that way? Mm -hmm. And really tracking it back and being like, OK, so there's a program somewhere back in my life that I created, which is why I have these emotions is it serving me anymore? Sometimes it is, and that's great. Keep it. Not mm. not a big deal. It's not like everything that you're doing is wrong, but uh, you know sometimes it's no longer serving you. Right. So for me, that was my biggest takeaway: having the tools to really uh, <clears throat> dive in there and uh, experience the emotions and decide whether or not I'm going to keep them. Nice. Now you you actually uh, brought up a point that like Tony and I talk a lot about. Well, not a lot, but we've talked about it a couple times. It's like, is this emotion serving you? And for me, like you know, Tony asks himself that question a lot. Mm. And uh, like I always think about so like even Ed Milet says it. He's just like you know, if it's not serving you, doesn't matter whether it's true or not, or whether you think it's true or not. Yeah. Just like if it's not serving you, get rid of it. And I can't for some reason I can't agree with that because like I'm like like. I guess if I'm not sure if it's not true or not, I'm okay with like getting rid of it. But if I actually think it's true, I'm like, no, like I would rather do truth than I would like decide if it's like benefiting my life or not. <clears throat> but yeah. You know what I mean? No, I, I get what you're saying for sure. I'm not sure if I agree with you or Ed Milet on it, um, but I, I definitely understand what you're saying. So basically, yeah, for me, it's just like truth. It is what it is. And like, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's serving or me or not. It's truth. So basically the way that I correlate a lot is like with, you know, spirituality or God, like with God, it doesn't matter whether what I believe about, like, let's say that I believe, or I read that, you know, God k killed off like all the people and he said to kill all the women and children and all that stuff, because that actually happens in the Bible. And then I'm like, wow, like that sounds pretty brutal. And then other people are like, man, that's like really mean. Like for me, I'm not just going to be like, like, yeah, like, I'm just going to be upset about it or, like, you know, anything. It's just, like, it, that's a truth statement, and it is what it is. It's not just, like, I'm not going to um, be upset with it or, like, be – I don't even know the right way to describe it, but – Well, you're, you're basically saying that, like, you're not going to be, like – oh, that wasn't true because that doesn't fit my view of God and that's not right. serving me, so I'm just going to ignore it. Right. Like you're, you're saying, that like, it's in the Bible, therefore I have to believe it, so I'm going to have to figure out a belief that then fits with that truth because I'm not going to let go of truth in the interest of doing the thing that benefits me. Yeah, so basically, I guess, yeah, that, that's basically what I mean. It's like uh, it doesn't matter how I feel about it, Is I guess is a better way. Like it, maybe it doesn't serve me. Maybe now I'm like, holy crap, like that makes me like – what if God tells me to kill a bunch of people and stuff, but it doesn't matter about how I feel about it or whether or not it serves me. It matters if it's true or not true. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that really matters to me. Not how I feel about it, but is it true or not true? But that's just one example. But yeah, um, no, I think that, I think that's really mature. I mean, 
I don't think we should get on the topic of religion. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, no, but I'm saying I feel like a lot of religious people don't have the level of the the truth matters, and I I, I don't mean that as like a backhanded compliment sure. to you. I mean genuinely, I think it's cool that you know even as a man of faith, you're like reality is still reality, right? Right. And I I respect <clears throat> that. So yeah. What do you think is the highest virtue, Bobby? Truth or kindness? I don't think there's one universal highest virtue. You had to pick one that was I, the I, highest. I'll pick one. I'll pick one. We know which one you're going to pick. <laughs> <laughs> I, would I, pick I, truth I don't think there time. is. I don't think truth is. Okay, so let me give you an example on where uh, being dishonest to me is better than being honest. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, take, for example, you know, a kid doesn't know his dad very well because he's very young. Okay, not that the dad's not there, but let's just say he's a cop, right? And he dies in the line of duty. Okay, well, that kid now gets to think that his dad was a hero. But let's say the actual truth is his dad was a crooked cop who got shot while he was selling drugs. Mm. Does it serve the kid to know the truth? Or do we let this young man grow up thinking that his dad was a hero? For me, I think letting that kid think his dad was a hero is going to be easier on him because the truth ser- serves no purpose at this point. I say tell the truth. Yeah. I, okay, I why would, is that? Oh, I would say that um, <clears throat> knowing the truth is going to make it more difficult for him initially, but it's possible that he could come up with all sorts of reasons why his dad died and none of them would be based on truth, whereas if he learned the truth, it would take a longer time for him to be able to repurpose that in a way that would be able to help him. But, like... I think the truth is powerful, and if he knew the truth, he'd be like, wow, there are so many lessons that I could have learned from that. Like, my dad was a little bit of a hypocrite. Like, he was doing things on the side, and, like, everybody's a hypocrite. That's, like, an important lesson in life. And then, like, his dad died doing something that he probably shouldn't have been doing, so, like, maybe I should, like, get my crap together and make sure that I... (laughs) I'm just going with your hypothetical Yeah, and I made up a situation on a podcast in five seconds. (laughs) But, but, uh, yeah, but no, like, that's that's a perfect example, like, in in, in, uh, any example, there's always situations like that. Whenever you think about truth, like, what, what you're talking about is what's easier in a way, you know what I mean? It's like, hey, what's easier for the kid? And that's, that's not, that's not honestly like for us to decide so like you know i don't know why i always want to go back to spiritual stuff like bible (laughs) so like you know a lot of people whenever they're teaching their kids about the bible they're like well let's take out the part where goliath or david cuts the head off goliath let's not tell him that it's like why that's the truth and like why why like withhold that from people and like not tell them stuff that actually happened or um like you know we think that we know what's best for other kids or for other people or like you know their situation it's going to change how they grow up but like you don't really know just like you know like what happened in my life when i was younger like actually made me the person that i am today and i went through a lot of brutal stuff and so actually it made me better because i went through that stuff who knows what if i had a great life and then now i'm some freaking goody two shoes who freaking like you know had everything and then i become some arrogant prick which i was right on the edge of doing anyway you know what i mean like i was right there where i was on the edge of like arrogance ego but then, like, maybe that actually was what humbled me. So it's, like, it's hard to say, but I will go with truth all uh, the way. And I understand and respect that. Um, and I'm not saying that my my example was perfect there. But I do think that uh, sometimes kindness is more important than the absolute truth. I mean, there for me, there have been plenty of times in my life where telling the truth served no purpose other than that it hurt somebody. From your perspective. Uh, from though. my perspective. Admittedly, from my perspective. And I went through some br- brutal shit when I was younger, too. So maybe what I'm thinking, maybe my programming is that, you know, adults are supposed to be there to protect children. Right. And if they're not there to protect them, um, bad things happen. Well, let's let's do a different example then. Like, let's use an example from two adults then. Let's say that, uh, let's say that you have an adult that somebody is, uh, like, they're, che- they're getting cheated on. But then you're like... Well, man, it's not my place to tell that other person that that person's cheating on him, even though I know, know I will, because I don't want to hurt that person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't don't be a homewrecker, man. Don't tell. Yeah, don't tell. Don't tell on your boy that's you know you see him cheating on him with his girl or whatever. So like you can't tell Slide her that. But then, but then like you you say, <laughs> hey, that's not my place. I'm not in that position. I'm just gonna decide. You know, hey, it's not my place to say anything. I'm just gonna not get into it. But then you know you're being kind. 
But for me, I think the truth, even though it's way brutal and it's going to hurt that person really freaking bad, I still think the truth is, like, for me, it's always... It always wins, but I, and I'm with you on that. That particular example, I'm I'm with you. You the, do that, the, yeah. The truth, gotcha. Is the way. Let's I get another example that. that we disagree on. Then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Jordan, Jordan, uh, truth or kindness, which is the highest virtue? I mean, if it's literally between those two, yep. Um, I, I would probably say truth. Did you Did you decide you were? Uh, I say, I think it varies. I think it varies, and I'm not going to give a definitive 100% across the board answer. He's going to give a because for me, in, <laughs> because in when my you have personal integrity, answers. which is for me, my integrity is different than Dakota's. Yeah, it's different than Jordan's, and it's different than yours. Mm-hmm. So, in my own integrity, it's interesting because before size seven, I would have said kindness. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've realized that being a rescuer and being a people pleaser isn't always the answer, but living a life of of, of genuine kindness and giving is extremely important but maybe yeah. that is your truth i see i think you that know? is truth i think that you can't have kindness without having truth in my like in my opinion like if if somebody's just like i don't know to me it's like it's like somebody's being nice to me almost feels like they're feeling sorry for me like if they're not telling me the truth like let's say they really don't like oh, me i got a good one well but just 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 for the uh, what is the best way? <laughs> back and forth. Back what, and is, forth. <laughs> what is the best way to empower people? Because I think that's where you were headed. Mm. What is the best way to empower people? Because you're talking about how you're trying, how we're trying to save people, and I think this is something that like sets us up to like start talking about politics. I don't give a crap. Um, <laughs> but it's like, what is the best way to empower people? How should you hold their hand? Do you help? Do you like? guide people do you take them with you do you give them money you know that doesn't work very well and everybody in this room knows that but <laughs> we're getting Bobby, so you know rich that. because they're just printing money right now and we have houses like so, we have assets. Yeah, I, I mean if i was to answer that question the best way to empower somebody is by for me thinking of them is to probably just find their giftedness from like knowing them and just say like, hey, here's what I see in you and here's the gifts that I see in you. And I think you have a lot of potential in this. So I think for me, that's that's the most powerful thing is when when other people see that light in you, that like, you know, you, like Ed Milet talks about all the time, like, you know, it's already there. Like, it's not like I'm gonna like go up to Jordan. I'm like, hey, Jordan, I can see that like, you know, you're really good at like digging holes or something. Like, and you're like, wait, what? No, I'm not even good at that. It's like, no, I see that in you. I see it. And you're like, dude, no. I'd be like, hey, Jordan, like, I can tell that you're, like, genuinely care about other people and you're a really good listener. And, like, intuitively, he's like, he knows that. And so I think that's the best way to empower somebody is just to, like, find what they're good at and, like, let them know that they're good at that. And then also, like, I don't know, for me, I always like to challenge people on, like, accomplishing certain things. I'm like, nah, you can do this. Yeah, I mean, uh, gosh, yeah. I mean, if, if you're really empowering somebody um, – you know, I want to piggyback off that. Like, I think if if you're willing to do the work in yourself and you you if you are truly inward focused to the point where you really understand yourself as a human being, then you can actually be outward focused and really actually see the gifts that people truly have, because all of us are unique in our own ways. Well, this right? is, that's where I get like uh I'll, Jimmy's not here, so he would be able to fight back on this. But the whole uh, that's why you're self, saying it right now. Yeah, well, no, no, <laughs> self, selfless versus selfish, and then yeah, they say self first, right? Self first, as opposed to mm-hmm. selfless or selfish. It's self first. Well, because um, like if you're truly acting as a steward, you have to be able to take care of yourself and build yourself to the base where you can actually genuinely impact other people. I, I think he's changing it too now. I think Jimmy is, like, kind of changing his whole perspective really? on that. I think so, yeah, wow. because, like, you know, he talks about, like, self-love and, like, you know, that everybody always says you have to love yourself first and stuff like that, and Jimmy didn't really like that because, like, no, like, like you got to love others first, which is, like, you know, basically what I think Tony's going into. Well, I, I was going to say, too, so I felt like I found the answer, like, the best way to empower people is to let them know that they have power, which is basically what you just said, but you said it on an individual level. So then I think about like the massive numbers of people out there and the responsibility of the government and like the response, like mm-hmm. what responsibility? I mean, I'm a big believer in no one owes you anything yep. and you don't owe anyone else anything either. But like 
then we still have these structures that I'm still pretty thankful for. Like, I'm glad we have a legislative system, even though there's a lot wrong with it. I'm glad that we have police. I'm glad that we had a school system, even though I resented part of it. Like, what is, how do you empower massive amounts of people if you have a, if you have like a structure like a government, you know? Like, how do you raise the consciousness of an entire population of people? I mean, if again, it's all going to start with you as the source, but if you have a genuine... 100% belief in something, you have a commitment, you have 100% intention in, in, in a cause or whatever the mechanism is, um, you just have to perform it at excellence at all well, times. You're, you're talking about you as an individual. I know, but I'm like, like if, if you have something that you believe in that is bigger than you and bigger than the people around you, if you put the intention that that really deserves to create that mask level scale of change then as you do that, other people around you will be attracted to that. People will be attracted to the gravity of what that cause or situation is. And as you can get more people involved, then it, it starts to snowball over time. Like you'll always have the early adopters, right? Like the people that just believe in you, believe in the cause. It's it's getting, it's getting, it's not even the late adopters, it's getting the middle. It's getting the herd crowd. How like, will you know that what you believe in uh, serves and empowers people? And on a mass scale, though, you know? You, I mean, you have to be fully certain. Uh, get very clear on who you are as a human being and what your purpose on this earth is and how your value is serving mankind. I was thinking more like the, not the individual, though. I don't think But you it can, always starts how, with yeah, someone. Say, how, can you, how could you think about a mass scale without thinking about an individual? Like if though? you're in charge of the government tomorrow, you're you the can. president. You're the president. Now you're, what do you do? You're you can't. still that individual. Yeah. No, but you, you cannot empower like hundreds of thousands or millions of people like that. You just mm -hmm. simply cannot do it. You can put programs and stuff in place for people to be able to empower themselves. Right. But the reality is there's a lot of motherfuckers out there who don't want to be empowered. They don't want to be empowered. Yeah. They like playing the victim. They like collecting a, chuck, a check from the government. They like sitting at home on their couch and not having a job. And that's the truth of it. Some people just fucking suck. Well, and well, some people don't even know. Well, you think I that, mean, too. I mean, you, you know what you don't know. You know you know what I mean? Like, well, you, you think that, too. And what's funny is, like, Dakota's kind of not in his head. Like, yeah, I know people like that. But also, Dakota's been the kind of person who's explained to me that, like, anybody can do it. Anybody can do it, but not everybody will do it. Anybody I can would, do I it. I would argue Tony, most people. Uh, right. Dakota and I are from shitty backgrounds. And we both decided that that wasn't for us. We're not going to stay there. We empowered ourselves. Now, 100%, that being said, you either become were, or defy your environment. Yeah. That's it's that's what it is. Yeah. yeah, and nobody nobody gets successful on their own. I'm not. Uh, I don't believe in the term self made whatsoever. There's always people helping you along the way. So I'm not trying to take away from that. Uh, obviously, we should help other people. People have helped me get to where I'm at, and people are going to help me get where I'm going. That's yeah. the truth of it. But the thing is, nobody's going to just grab you and drag you up to the top. And even and even if they did, it wouldn't actually benefit you a whole lot. Yeah. You're going to fall right back down. Even if somebody did pull you all the way up, like let's say your freaking dad dies tomorrow and then you get a $3 million, you know, it mm -hmm. doesn't really change anything. You yeah, know, if the baseline hasn't been created of how to actually manage your money, how to invest it, how, how to actually use your money for good, generational wealth, if you don't have those things... Um, Camera two died. Oh, Camera no. two died. <laughs> we need another battery. Oh, God. <laughs> Swap three is quick. Abort, abort. Yeah, me and Tony for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> All right, yeah. now pan the camera away from Bobby. Does it, <laughs> does does it, does does it, it have swap out that battery, Jonathan? Thank you, sir. It, does it have a... No, or it's supposed but to be I, I'm curious. ...so that it records no matter what, right? No, it won't record if the battery's dead. Oh. Oh, somebody just turned off the other one. Jordan. Do we still have audio? Yeah, we still have audio. Okay, so... I'm curious while well, they figure that out. Does anybody in this group disagree that people have to empower themselves? That's a no. People have to That's empower no. themselves. Well, um, I, like, I was, I was going to talk about the self-made thing because I agree with that. Uh, no, I mean, to answer your question, I mean, 
the effort has to come from within. I mean, you have to be willing to do the shit. Dude. You, if you want to empower yourself, there might be people that help you get to that point. And I would argue like Psy Basic, Psy 7, Men's Leadership, all these things will help you understand yourself. But you have to be willing to do the work. No, you do. And honestly, I've tried to empower so many losers in my life who did not want to be empowered whether it was through money, my time, like giving them other resources like books and stuff like that. And the reality is you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Right. I mean, you just can't make somebody choose to, you know, move their life up. And, you know, and I, I use the term losers earlier because I get passionate about it because that's what I associate the most with my life. But that can also be like, mm. you know, John and Susie homeowner with 2.3 kids who talk about wanting more, but then they're like, Never oh, well, I'm it. not going to work on the weekends. You need different batteries. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go home and put in three hours a night trying to figure out a business that can get yeah. me out of my nine to five. I mean, you know, it's funny. So like, it's funny that you actually mentioned that because the people like, usually people don't bother me. Like, you know, if somebody is like truly happy with, I don't care. Like, you know, even if they're getting it from the government, whatever, like, you know, if they're getting social security and they're getting $1,200 a month and they're sincerely happy, I, like that does not bother me. I'm like, man, I'm actually happy for you that you're happy. Like for me, that's amazing. What bothers me is well, whenever, actual, actual fulfillment. Right. Yeah. When it, it bothers me whenever people are complaining while they're getting that, well, I'm on a fixed income. I can't I can't go out and make anything more. I'll I'll lose my social security. I I want this in my life. I want this, this, and this. And you're like, okay, we'll just do this. No, no, I can't, I can't lose, I can't miss out on this, this, mm -hmm. and this. And they're like, they're they're complaining about where they're at, but they're not willing to do anything about it. Those are the people that bother me more than, you know, just like, hey, I'm happy with my life. I'm okay with like, you know, living this way. I'm okay with not growing. Like as long as they're content and actually like happy, that's cool, whatever. Yeah, no, and uh, yeah, and I, I think I got passionate about it with like the loser thing and all that. And I, yeah. I wanna make sure that it's super clear. I also agree. If you're at a point where you're like, you are John and Susie, homemaker, mm -hmm. And you guys have your 2.3 kids and your two cars and all that. And you're like stoked about it. Yeah. Then that's awesome. That's awesome. Like, that's great. That's great. That, that wouldn't work for me. Right. But if that's what works for you genuinely, great. And to your point, if you are living off the government, I don't. I don't respect you, maybe, but I mean that's fine. You found your happiness. If that's what makes <laughs> well, you happy, I mean, I'm I, sorry. I'm not gonna. No, no, no. I, I think, not respect I think there's a purpose. I get it, because like whenever, well, like just like the same thing though. Like let's say like the SBA loan or something, or like some kind of things that the government's throwing out free money. Did you did you cash your uh, money that the government sent oh, you? Oh hell yeah! So that's what I'm saying is like oh hell yeah, do whatever, dude. I don't give a crap. Oh, I definitely did. And uh, also, I won't, hang on. I'm not used to being recorded, so I actually want to clarify that too. Collecting money from the government is fine if you're not abusing the system, too. Yeah. I, I actually like that we have the right. assistance programs and stuff in place there, so I'm not saying that universally across the board about right. everybody who right. collects Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, um, I, say I, I just don't give a crap. If, like, if you take money from the government and stuff, like, it is what it is, but it's when you complain about it and then, like, you don't go out and do anything more. Like, that, well, that's annoying. But. but compare that to what, like, Ed, was, Ed Milet was saying about depression and how people aren't trying to accomplish whatever it is that would make them the best versions of themselves. And then we were kind of talking about like how you always fall back to your internal thermostat with like if you inherit $3 million tomorrow, but you're not worth $3 million in right. your head in and your you don't head. believe you deserve it. You don't have the things that you can do with the money in order to accomplish keeping the $3 million, then you're going to end up losing it. What do you think then if you take what you guys were just saying about receiving the handouts and being happy with where you're at and compliant with where you're at and the other principle, which is that um, nothing is stable because if you just let it go, it will rot eventually like the yeah, door, growth or decay. like this, you know, wooden door behind me, like it's going to rot and decay eventually if you let it sit and we're either in growth or we're dying. So like. For those yeah. people, like maybe it's there's no in between. Would you say like if they're if they're happy, then like good for them. But I'm gonna keep growing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. And I think uh, you know because we're all entrepreneurs, I think it's easy for us to be like growth means business. But I mean, I don't care if you're 
if you're unsatisfied with your life, I believe you need to find something to throw your efforts into. Yeah. And that might be something that has no financial reward. Right. You might be like, I want to become the best kayaker I can be. Yep. And if you truly dive into that, you're going to feel more fulfilled at the end of the night. No- end of the day. Yep. It could be a charity. I mean, it can be any number of things, but you, if you're feeling unfulfilled, you need to find something and go all in on find it. Your yeah. Find your passions. It doesn't find even have dreams. to be a passion. I hate the word passion. People okay. throw that around too much. Yeah. Like just throw yourself into something. You're going to build passion by yeah. getting good at it. But I, yeah. So I actually made a video mm-hmm. um, about success on this exact topic is like, look, I don't care whether you're financially successful or anything for me, success actually is growing. So it's hard to be successful without actually like growing in any area. So like I, I have a good friend of mine, Matt Bloomfield, his goal was always to go to Arizona and hike the mountains. And now he's doing that all the time, dude. It's not like he makes a lot of money, but he takes pictures pictures in beautiful areas and he's hiking mountains all the time my sister her goal was always to have kids she wasn't able to have kids because her body wouldn't let her and so she adopted she's got like five kids right now to me that's successful like so yeah it has nothing to do with monetary at all it just has to do with actually like you know going out and getting what you say that you actually want and then just growing in that yeah i agree Especially when money is an invisible idea, we all put faith into and we keep printing it. <laughs> just keep printing. Keep printing. It's just worth less every single day. Might as well get more of what you, what you want. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you get enough of it, it doesn't matter that it's worth less. You know? <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's, 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 uh, let's get into the next thing then. Uh, do you guys think we're in a housing bubble? Oh, God. (laughs) What an original question to bring to your podcast. I just created a little (laughs) report that I was going to send out to this guy who said he was interested in investing. And the only thing that I could go back to... Like I'm a, I always have to like premise it with like I'm a Neanderthal. I'm not, I'm not an economist. I might not know what I'm talking about. But uh, you know, in 2008, uh, there were a lot of builders. And the builders were getting all the money that they possibly needed from the banks. And there were a lot of buyers, and the buyers were getting approved if they had a pulse. So they or were not. The, yeah, <laughs> they were dead. You I mean, dead. I, I've heard that like literal dogs got home loans before 08. So the lenders were giving out loans. And then uh, when the crash happened, the banks went, oh, sorry, we can't give you any more money to finish up any of these houses. And the buyers who were previously approved weren't approved anymore. And the houses that were actually finished and ready to go on the market went down so far in value that the builders who built them in the first place couldn't even sell them and break even. Yeah, the rug was ripped under them. So all these builders went out of business and went bankrupt. And then mortgage foreclosures started happening and people started losing their homes and hedge funds were backed up by mortgage notes and all kinds of stuff. So all of that stuff almost created what we have now, which is that for the last 10 years, no houses were built. Like, there was a very little yeah. supply. Yeah, so from, like, World War II, um, I believe it's, like, 15 to 20 million homes were built every single decade. And because of 08, 2010, uh, you know, this last decade, only, like, 5 million homes were built. Yeah. Which is considerably less. I mean, really, if you think about, like, uh, and I didn't mean to take over your, your discussion, but there's, like, major factors that have caused the this monster that we're in. Um, you know, the 2008 crash completely killed buyer confidence and builders in the, in, in the real estate industry. It just did um, in, in all of all facets. It was the atomic bomb of the real estate industry at the time. Um, so that being said, buyer confidence and builder confidence is back. It's here. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's very evident that it's here. Yeah. And there's during a time of economic uncertainty with covid People were buying houses without seeing them. Yeah. Well, no, no. So here's the thing. So you, you have the buyer confidence back. Millennials are buying. We are all, all millennials are now in the, the age group of either being on their second home or they are financially stable to finally buy their own home. Um, really what COVID did was it just put a spotlight on everyone's shitty lives. Like it, it literally made people be stuck at home and have to deal with their own reality, whether that was they have to work from home. They realize they hate their job. They realize they hate their house. They realize that it's not big enough. They realize, oh, shit, my kid's in school and has to be from home. And this is just not working. So, I mean, that that alone created so much demand as well. 
Interest rates were historically the lowest they've ever been in American history. So the money's cheap. Buyer confidence is finally back. Builders are here. And everyone hates their house. And Yeah. And then the thing that uh, <laughs> I've been saying a lot, I know you guys, have, I'm sure you've heard me say this, but inflation. Um, so, like, everybody says they're in a housing bubble. And that everybody thinks it's going to crash. And I'm like, dude, they just printed, like, more money than they've... Like, in the last year because of COVID, they printed 25% of America's total money right. in one year. I heard it's 30%, but either hey, way... Well, yeah. I mean, that is a substantial... I mean, yeah, yeah inflation's way, here. Like, it's let's here. say $100,000 house. It's not going to go below that $100,000 ever again because of inflation. Now that dollars were so much less, so yeah. it's not going to happen, in my opinion. Obviously... You know, I've not been in the real estate game long enough, and everybody else is going to think I'm real stupid. But Well, none of us at this podcast have. But I hope we're in a bubble. I honestly don't care. I'll make money in any market. Yeah. But I hope we're in a bubble because I can't find a fucking contractor to save my goddamn life right now. <laughs> and I hope it all pops and all the contractors start coming to me, and then I get to, you know... <laughs> like be like, oh, look who came crawling back. Uh, uh, you 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 literally want the housing market to crash so you can get a contract. <laughs> like, yes. He's like, yeah, I need I need the housing market to crash. That's so, so fucked can come work seven on days from Sunday. It's not even funny. Yeah, <sighs> please come work on my house. Hey, yeah. if you guys are watching this, if you could help Bobby out, that'd be great. Yeah, if there are any contractors out there, that'd be great. <laughs> just, just go to clientinvestments dot com or. And uh, ride on just, trailers with Bobby. Just message LTD. We'll get you guys uh, set up. We'll get Bobby a quote and uh, <laughs> <laughs> just put your markup in on it. Yep, exactly. We'll uh, we'll let them know what's up. I don't know. I don't. I don't feel they're in a housing bubble. I, I just think there's I, so I many. Th I think prices will. Um, I think we'll see a little bit of a dip because I think we're real high. When? Yeah. Um. Well, it's hard to say with COVID now because we were supposed to be due for one already. But like you guys said, they just. They're like, oh, I know, I'll print money. Like, yep. <laughs> which even at my like rudimentary level of eco economic knowledge, that's like the dumbest idea. <laughs> but, like, I know, but everybody else is like, yeah, let's do it. Like, well, I, I mean, know that's, so that's little, the thing, and I feel like, like somebody should have stopped that. Like, yeah. Well, but, like, bank, that's neither here nor blanket there. and b blanket solutions don't actually create real change in answers. Like, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't. Like the, the eviction memorandum that has killed landlords all over the country. Because tenants that were really shit and weren't paying their rent, like that landlord got screwed. They were literally powerless. I'm you know, that guy. When they're, the, when they're the ones that are providing the housing, right? Yeah, the landlords yeah. are still alive. They're just uh, not doing as well. Yeah, I mean, well, Bobby Bobby got really affected. <laughs> I, I bounced by back, but I mean, yeah, no, I was I was in trouble. I was in trouble. We th went through all my savings. During COVID, right. like all the companies. Thank savings. God like you had that. Because penny. what if you didn't? You How relied on you that cash flow. Savings? I had like thirty eight thousand wow. dollars in savings, which is not enough for a company my size. But yes, yeah, lesson learned. How, how fast did uh, you go through that? About three and a half months. Wow. wow. And what? Uh, and that was with me still skipping certain bills, like sewage bills and shit. Wow. So then I got a lien put on one of my trailer parks, and uh, what saved me is I started wholesaling. Uh, and I yeah. had that extra, yeah, yeah. And you guys actually we, sent me the we, contract we helped, for that. We helped a little bit with that, right? Yeah, you did, you did, you did. Uh, and no, but I mean, then I started wholesaling and I was able to take like money that my tenants weren't paying me yep. and go in there. But I mean, I, you know, I started contracting out for other people. I started figuring out like what yep. I could do to get money in, but it was, it wasn't enough because my company's at the size yep. where it's like, it's not one person's job no to make $20,000 a month, yeah. dude, you know? Yep. So that's, that's the scary thing about whenever you get so big, you get to a point where you're like, like I was talking to Diana the other day and I'm just like, there was a point where we messed some stuff up and the, the tax, the taxes and it looked like we lost like four hundred thousand dollars because Thanks. because the accountant oh like we weren't putting things in the asset category where you're putting it over in the liability whenever we were buying properties so, yeah that'll do it yeah so i was freaking out dude i'm just like dude i was like we're in a spot right now we're like it's not like you can't go hustle and sell yeah, some cars. Yeah, like, exactly. It's not like oh, like uh, you know, let's go work really hard and make ten grand real quick. It's more like uh, no, like it's either you know we figure out what the heck's going on or we file bankruptcy. Like it's just there's no other mm -hmm. choice. Gosh. Um, but yeah, so I was thinking about the times though. Whenever we were like, whenever COVID first hit. Um, you know, we finance all of our stuff. I don't know if you, you know, use mm -hmm. the banks for that, but we finance all of our stuff. So we had all of our properties 
Um, I would say the mortgages on all of them were like in like I don't know nine thousand at the time. And uh, what was our total debt? Just for I don't even know. Like nine hundred thousand. Yeah. One point one million yeah. or something. Somewhere between yeah, somewhere between nine hundred and one point one. Um, but so we had like, you know, $9,000 in debt and then, uh, we had like $40,000 on credit cards. We're doing our first big flip on Lynn Avenue. It was like oh, our my first gosh, one. Lynn. Yeah. So, um, and we were going to buy another property on top of it. The one that we're about to lose like four grand on Washington center. We've had it over a year and a half now, which obviously because I hate you know, that, that property during, for you. Yeah. That was during, <laughs> dude, that was during a uh, COVID. Screw though. That piece so literally we're going to buy this property. We offered her like, I can't remember like 70,000 or something, which we shouldn't even have went that high because it's on a well and a septic, but you know, we just, we just on like, like a quarter of an acre. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> even we're going to freaking, uh, we go to offer on this property and then like, she's taken uh, like a week and stuff. And then after she decides to do it, we freaking sign the contract and then like, and then COVID happens and we're like, dude, tenants aren't going to pay. We got 40 grand on credit cards. We got no savings. All my lines of credit were maxed out. I'm like, dude, this is scary. We shouldn't buy this house because that house is going to like max us all the way out, like all the way out. So like, you know, we had about $70,000 worth of buffer room at that point. That house was going to put it like we got no buffer room except for like, you know, obviously I could pull credit cards or whatever I needed to do at that point. But the company credit cards were all maxed out. My lines of credit were all maxed out. Like all the cheap money was maxed out. And uh, um, the lady, like we told her like, hey, I don't think we're going to be able to buy this house. And she's like just started bawling on like just crying and uh, she's like, I'm not gonna be able to get my dream house. Then I was supposed to close on it a week. And I was like, all right, I guess we'll just do it then. Oh my gosh. <laughs> because you know, whenever we tell somebody that we're going to buy it and do it, then I'm like, holy crap. And so like Tony and I had a discussion. Oh, you're a man of your word. Yeah. I was like, screw it. We're going under. If we go under, we lose everything. Like I, I, I mean, have... I was going to bail. You go <laughs> under, you go under with integrity. I like it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I had, I had everything on the line. Like literally I would have lost my house, like everything. Mm-hmm. I would have lost yeah. all of it. Um, on like, and it was like, it was seriously felt like we were like right there at that sure. line during COVID because I was like, no tenant is going to pay all this stuff. And then. You know, all the tenants paid. Everything was great. We freaking, Tony and I got on the roof, roofed that house, laid the floor. Like, dude, let's get this flip over. We're just trying to hurry it. up through it. And we got through it. Well, and too. And we the, made like 40 grand. The tenants, um, I was trying to figure out if we should reach out to them and say anything about how we would offer them help if they needed help. I think it was a good thing we were just quiet. And we were kind of just like, you should probably do what you've been doing. Like yeah. It's still your responsibility to pay your rent. Somebody said something on Facebook, and we at least were like, no, that's not true. You do have to pay your rent. Yeah. Yeah. So, where I fucked up was um, I should have taken a more hands on approach, and I let my ego get in the way of that. Um, because I was like, my tennis can just fucking pay. Like, just figure it out. They're all still working. Uh, cause you know, here in Indiana, we didn't shut down the way the rest of the world right. did. Right. Um, and Thank you know, God. and so I was yeah. thinking I'd have like over our, 50 mobile homes or whatever i was thinking i'd have like three or four who would have some real problems and that's not a big deal um but when it became optional to pay your rent so let me back up a second i loved mobile home parks for uh how recession proof everybody always says they are right um because you know all your tenants go down if you're not in real estate you may not know this but your a class tenants become b tenants b tenants become c tenants so on and so forth so in a recession when everybody moves their housing costs down theoretically i would get better tenants right. um so it's funny how that works yeah so uh i was gonna say so i want to make one point real quick on that i actually i mean I don't know who's going to listen to this or not, but they might be upset with me. But I actually think that those people are more likely to not just because, like, usually people are in positions that they're in based on excuses that they make and not actually owning up to certain things. Well, from my, the, from my that's perspective. That's exactly where I'm going with this. So when, when this semi-recession uh, happened, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't about everybody was losing their houses or anything. It was basically you have the option to pay your rent or not. Well, a lot of my tenants are scum is the truth of it. And I don't care who hears that because they've made a lot of really bad choices. I hope they change. But as of right now, they're scum. Yeah. You're Bobby's tenants. Yeah. Only only Bobby's tenants. Yeah. I'm sure your guys' tenants are all 
amazing. But, Ours actually are. But. Uh, no, I, I mean, <laughs> well, and that's the thing. I have some great tenants, but most, a high enough percentage of mine, about yeah. 50% based on yeah. what happened during COVID. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, oh I God. went down to collecting 50% of my rent. That's freaking Because nuts. it was just optional, and they knew I couldn't sue them. I couldn't evict them. I couldn't do anything. So we were still turning over units, and we were just sitting on them. I wouldn't even rent them out because what am I going to yeah. do? Have somebody move in, pay me one time, and then just be there in the property, which costs me money to have them in that property. Property and it's going to cost me money to evict them and cause headaches. Wh- which I, one costs you more, like uh, putting them in there and then like just letting them in there and not paying, or do, like does it cost you more not having them in there? Because isn't your cost basically the same? Like you still got to pay insurance, all that other uh, stuff. It's essentially the same. I mean, there are like usages of like the water and stuff like that. Um, but the truth was, I just had so much well, going on. Could, I was could wreck the place too. You know? Yeah, that's yeah, true. and that's, the people that my are turnovers pay are super will. expensive. Yeah, I don't get that's places true. back clean. That's true. Um, I didn't think about that. But no, I mean, it was it was awful. And I know everybody's like, oh, boo-hoo, poor landlord. But yeah, it was really a, a super tough time when you go from, you know, collecting. You know, I was collecting. I was making the best, at the time, the best money I'd ever made in my life. And then just all of a sudden, the faucet was off. Yeah, And scary. so, I mean, I'm not going to go into, like, what we have in reserves now, but I'm telling you, we learned from that yeah. lesson. Yeah, like, we got we a learned lot that more. that faucet gets shut off sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I have a lot of, like, mentors uh, who have been around. They were in, like, back in 08 and all that, and they yep. kind of walked me through it. Um, but, I mean, it was a really scary time. I owned I owed the utility company something like $20,000 or no some way. shit. And they were about, they were like, listen, we're sorry, but we're going to shut everything off. Wow. And, I mean, there's just no, yeah. you, if you don't have $20,000, you don't have $20,000. Right. So. I say that's one nice thing. You know, a lot of people, like, you know, even you've asked about it before in other events. You're like, dude, like, what do you think about people whenever they say, like, hey, why don't you focus on flipping, wholesaling? You got this, you got that. Like, that's one nice thing about our business is, like, we do generate income from, like, a lot of different places. We're trying to get it mostly from rentals, but at the same time, at least we are getting it from different places as well, just for, like, different things like that. We're like, dude, Yeah, like, you got to diversify somewhat. Yeah, definitely. like, which is, like, you know, it's all still in real estate, but still there's short-term money, there's long-term mm-hmm. money, and, like, you know, there's different aspects of that, which it sounds to me like you pivoted, which yeah. is an overused term, yeah. I guess. But yeah, It is an overused term, but, yeah, <laughs> that is exactly what I did. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and honestly... I, I, I got lucky. Mm-hmm. I got lucky because my first deal put, uh, my first wholesale deal put twenty thousand dollars in my pocket. My yep. very first one out the gate. Hey, that's was your utility 20, bills right there. That's exactly what it went to. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it went to, that's man. Crazy. And I couldn't even pay off the whole fucking thing because I had other bills that right. needed paid. But yeah. it was the it was the first big chunk that I was able to move there. Um, you know, and I mean, I had other strategies I could have done. I could have sold one of my trailer parks. You know, I've yeah. got equity in them. You know, I could have. Yep. Gone and got a factory job, which wouldn't have been enough. No, but, but uh, see, that's the funny thing is everybody thinks like, "We'll just go get a job and do this." Like, that's the do you know slow, how long? That's like the that's slowest gonna take way you, to make yeah, money. Yeah, thousand dollars, exactly. making a thousand dollars a week, and then I, you still gotta live, and then you like you're trying to manage and everything else. Exactly. Still. That's what I was say is you're trying to run everything else that's already in motion. You can't just like, <laughs> yeah. hey, I'm gonna go uh, take this off and expect everything to go well. Mm-hmm. So, but, so something I wanted to talk about since we were kind of talking about the uh, the housing market. Um, and where it was going, uh, I wanted to talk about the things that were going to affect it, which is like when they actually start being allowed to foreclose. Um, and Yikes. then uh, demand decreasing maybe a little bit. I don't know that that many of like the middle class really lost their jobs. It seems mm-hmm. like maybe just the like. Well, it, it was a lot of like the service industries, you know, yeah. restaurants, feels, I mean, entertainment. It feels like COVID was just a way of like making the rich richer and the poor poorer. And like instituting some government controls to like kind of. I, test I think them it's out it's it's bit. really just a, it's it, it, you know it just gets chalked down to like adversity will always be there. How are you going to deal with the adversity that comes? I will tell you during COVID that was my first full year as being a real estate broker, and I sold fifty seven transactions in my first full year as an agent. I did ten million in sales, and I've never made six figures in my life. And was there a global pandemic? Yeah, but I chose to fight through the adversity and, and use it as a leverage point to create wealth and success. Something else that I think is going to change the curve to and make it so that the prices don't dip as much, like maybe for Bobby, is just the access to information. Because Dakota and I didn't know, we didn't tar- well, I mean, we don't still target them on purpose, but we still get mortgage foreclosures. And like we, 
we didn't do like some crazy job or anything like that. We did three, almost four, three, almost four mortgage foreclosures now that we saved from going. Wow. So it's like there, there are wholesalers and real estate investors now who have the knowledge to get in front of the seller before it goes to the bank, before it goes to the the investor who pays the most money for it at the sheriff's sale or whatever. So I think we mm. have the ability to like a competitive advantage yeah. to save the curve. No, just like access to information, like the freedom of right. information yeah. act and like being able to like freaking text people and cold call people. We didn't even have that 10 years ago, really like in 2008, they didn't have multi-line dialers that they were actively right. advertising on batch leads. Sure. No, I mean, you had to call but, everyone individually, but I think uh, to that, and I mean, I can't speak to what like hedge funds and stuff will do, but there are so many more people in, um, in uh, pre foreclosure and foreclosure uh, now than there even was in like 08, 09. Uh, I don't have the numbers, but it, this is why we need a Jamie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, because uh, I was I was speaking with uh, a Jay Redding about that recently, and the numbers I can't. I'm not even going to throw out a multiple because <laughs> I'll be wrong and I don't want to be wrong on record. But it was uh, <laughs> that's your program uh, speaking, Bobby. Yeah, no, but uh, we have astronomically more foreclosures. So I mean, yes, we have more access to information and getting that. My personal house was in pre foreclosure uh, and I bought it off that person. But I don't know that. I think there's still going to be a reckoning. I think there's still going to be a reckoning of some sort. Not the way we saw in 08, but I think we're going to dip down a little bit. That's my personal take on it based off the information I've heard. Yeah, all the people who we've got in front of that haven't paid didn't pay for like a year and a half. And I remember hearing stories of people not paying, and it's like, yeah, so, you know, your house payment was 1000 a month, and you haven't paid for 18 months, so you must have 18000 in the bank. And they're like, no. I have 800 bucks. Like, how? <laughs> yeah, they just... Yeah, people who get their house foreclosed on aren't financially responsible, typically. Well, the crazy thing is that they got the house in the first place, which means they had to have been at some point for a little amount of stretch in their life because, like, you know, you have to be at least a 650 to 680 usually to get approved. Dude, my personal home that I bought... Never mind. <laughs> no, okay. no they, because they, we're gonna share this on our facebook walls one of it's my one of my friend's brothers so i'm not gonna talk right. about it yeah yeah you're good no worries i mean you can go all the way down to like a 580 with some of those vas yeah and those, fha like, and all that honestly like the barrier to entry to buy a house is not that much like you it, you need to you need to have a credit card for six months to a year and make sure it's paid off and and have a little bit of money, maybe, still, or somebody it, that can give you money. It's still a lot freaking harder than it was before, and it's a whole lot harder than getting yeah. a car. Trust me on that. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> we'll get. We'll get. Says the epic car sales. Yeah, we'll here. get people approved on cars that you know they don't even have to have a credit score. You know Gosh, I mean? that just scares mm-hmm. me. I just, no cars. I mean, you know, that's how you establish your credit. That's a great way to establish your credit too. Is like you know you have a smaller payment, but a house is like you know that's a big deal. But. Um, yeah, I guess we got so we got a couple more minutes. So uh, I guess we could just end with, uh, you know, Tony and I have been seeing a lot of these big hedge funds buying uh, like massive, 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 massive amount of houses. So if wow. you think it's gonna crash, do you think that they're just stupid, or do you think that they have a strategy? Yeah, I wanna I wanna actually give a little bit more context. Open Door is a company. I think they partnered with Realtor.com or Realtor.com owns them or something. But the right. guys in Los Vegas would lose money if they flipped this house because of how much work it needs. And instead, they're selling it to Open Door for whatever the Realtor.com price is. That's what Open Door is paying, like 90, wow. 90% of value. When the property needs 30% of value worth of work, which is crazy. And it's not just Open Door. It's also like Blackstone, like, you know, the mm-hmm. Illuminati type. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Some, of the other, some of the other hedge funds are buying up real estate, and it's almost like they know, like, hey, we need our money out of what, like, cash Evan, and so into an asset. I'll say Evan Barney actually has been talking about it, and he says shout that he works. Shout out to Evan Barney. Yeah, shout out to him. He said that he works for them, and then he says that they're using other people's money to buy it. So he said that's why they don't give a crap about it and why they're just wanting to, you know, keep buying stuff. But I want to know your guys' thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, I, I from what I've heard of, like, other investors with, like, hedge funds, like, they want to make, like, 4%. 
like a four cap, like no, nothing. And, uh, you know, like, again, like it always goes back to like real estate is a great place to hedge against debt. I mean, and inflation or inflation is what I, what I meant to say. And, 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 and like, honestly, like anybody that's holding on their cash right now is losing their ass. Really? Right. Even if it's still there, it's just becoming worth less. I mean, Correct. so how do you hedge against that? You have assets and you use debt, right? I think that all of us are in agreement with that. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great point. we're all specifically doing it. Yeah. And we're making well, money off of it. Yeah, and also, <laughs> I mean, your your tax benefits and all, all that. Um, I mean, everybody mm. knows the four pillars of real estate. Um, but uh, What are the four pillars of real estate for our uh, viewers? Oh, for, for the listening pleasure, it is... Uh, Your tenants ca- would love to know. <laughs> cash flow, appreciation, uh, principal pay down, and then your tax advantages as well. Um, nice. But... Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I think I think as far as the hedge funds go, and I don't know much on this. I'm not educated on this topic. But I think anybody who bought real estate 10 years ago looks like a genius today. And anybody who bought real estate 20 years ago looks even smarter. So real estate's the most forgiving asset class. You can buy a crappy, crappy cash flow negative deal right now. And that same, that same deal in 30 years will make you a millionaire. Yeah. You know, so oh, I mean... Yeah. I, Dude, I, I don't know if that's why they're doing it or not. I'll say, I'm glad that you actually mentioned that. Uh, man, we're like right at an hour, which is about where I was thinking, but uh, maybe we'll get into it next time. Um, I want to know what you were... Well, we, can, at least, we, can we don't have to talk these, about it. I want to know if these cameras are going to shut off or not, too. It might be good just oh, to they go will, over No, they've turned off already. We've already restarted them a couple times. Oh, okay. Yeah, but the battery died. But uh, So basically what I was going to say was... Um, I was thinking about that because I think about, you know, we have some friends of ours who keep paying retail for houses and I'm like, well, you know what? Like they're making money off of it. It, They're going to make more money off of it because it is going to appreciate. It's going to go up in value. But then I think of the reason of why we buy below value and that's that way we're able to scale way faster. So basically if you keep buying for houses for retail, you have a limited amount that you're able to scale because you had to keep working. You're playing a long game, not a short game. Yeah, you're you have to use that money to keep putting those down payments and you only have a limited amount of money but the down payments. But if you find a good enough deal on a property, you can get unlimited, literally unlimited properties. Well I Mm -hmm. I think about it too, you wouldn't even have to get a discount. So, like, you could use Pace Morby's strategy to buy somebody's house on seller financing in a good part of town, Airbnb it, and be cash flow positive from day one yeah. and look like a genius later. That's what he does. Yeah. Well, and it's going to appreciate if it's in a good area of town, too. So there's a there's an area of Fort Wayne that I really believe is, like, the ultimate appreciation area. Um, and What's the uh-huh. Uh-huh. What's uh-huh. code? I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> tell, me, uh, tell me the zip code, Bobby. I need yeah, to know the zip code. I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you so, think it's 07. I already know. So I was 02, looking, 07. Yeah, 02. Yes. Gorgeous, yeah, gorgeous yeah. 02. Yeah, yeah. West uh, Central uh, and nothing else. Uh, it's like that's what the 02 is. Besides no, downtown. but uh, I was looking at properties on there today, actually, that just full retail price. I'm like, I bet I could cash flow like 150 bucks on this. And, uh, you know, like what would that look like in like 30 years? Uh, I, that being said, I'm not going to do it because I'm not at a point where well, I... Well, and you can get way better deals. Well, I can get better cash flow deals. I don't know that I could get better appreciation deals. Mm. Um, but I'm just not at the point where I'm comfortable with like, hey, shit hits the fan. And yeah. now I'm cash flow negative 50 bucks right. or something like that. Because I, I, I don't want to lose money You could have said ever. like 08 and we'd be like, nah, we're not buying there. <laughs> <laughs> it was the 08 then. <laughs> worry about it i is, love the is 08. it really the 08 no, oh the 08. i was saying it's like yeah we're we'll just play a <laughs> process fans. of elimination with bobby yeah so is it 07 <laughs> maybe it is 07 i knew. So. 07. i said 07 the first one <laughs> yeah. i knew is 07 dude i don't yeah. know 07 well enough to even like we just we're like hey it's we'll a, buy a couple down no. there just because like, honestly it's more about i don't want to be wrong uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll just no. we'll just be like hey bobby we found this good deal the guy won't talk to us anymore you told us about it originally go down there <laughs> buy it we'll take it list on the mls and make the majority of the money <laughs> there you go there you go i love that strategy <laughs> That strategy does work. We learned that. I made money off that deal, though, so I mean, I'm not dude, mad. I'm, I'm not mad. I mean, dude, it took you, what, an hour? Yeah, yeah. It I, took us 367 days. <laughs> yeah. We had a lot more invested oh in that. But, yeah, you made money quick, and, uh, yeah. Um, so I guess uh, 
We're going to have to wrap this up. You guys got anything else you guys want to say before we head out? <sighs> if you have a trailer park that you want to sell, call me. Look in the camera when you call me. <laughs> Check out the Psy events, PSI. Uh, I promise it'll change your life 100%. I'm, I'm willing to stake it on that. Oh, fuck, you did a selfless one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he went straight to <laughs> me. Yeah, yeah. All sell me. me. Sell me a trailer park. Now my you, benefit, my reward. Uh, we're, I, I definitely, definitely believe in the Psy seminars, and I think that you should go to the Psy Basic. Um, yeah, we're, we might bring it back to Fort Wayne here again sometime. We will. It's a possibility. And uh, I just want to say, watch the next episode because there's going to be a lot more of these. And, uh, and yeah. shout out to Jonathan hooking up the cameras just oh, like a big old boss. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. Shout out to him. You and pop uh, your head onto the camera real quick. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He was there the whole time. <laughs> I love it. Yep. Stay tuned for more, guys. We're gonna be uh, we're gonna be releasing hopefully a whole lot more of these. Hopefully this thing goes well. Hopefully we got all of the audio and the video figured out, and uh, we're gonna be having some more of these. So stay tuned.